Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And, and Father, I'm grateful that no matter how difficult the things we face are before us, that you are there. You are there to guide us. You are there to lead us. You are there to encourage us. So Father, today we come to you, looking to you for leadership, looking to you for encouragement, looking to you for hope, joy. Today, Father, we ask that in this service that you would enter in, that you would take control, that all the other distractions of this world are set aside, and that our focus would be upon you. We ask, Father, that your will would be done in this service, that those who come in with heavy hearts would have their load lightened, that those who who come in seeking would find. And we're grateful. Again, Father, we're grateful for the blessings you've given us. We ask these things this morning, Father, in your blessed name. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's start off with some announcements. There are some Christmas cards up here on the front row of the, the well, front row seats. And uh, your, your name should be on them. So if you please come up and check and get your cards before you leave today. And if you're not here today and are watching online and would like to pick up your cards, the church will be open on Monday and Thursday of this week. So um, you can pick them up or whatever. We have a sign-up sheet for, for uh, snow shoveling. And I told my brother last night if he wasn't in church, I was going to fill in all the empty seats <laughs> or all the empty spots with his. But until then, I'm going to pass this around. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around, and if you're interested in signing up to help shovel walks and things like that, I think the right side is for Wednesday nights and the left side is for Sunday mornings. Uh, please fill in as many as you'd like, but like I said, if Kelly don't come to church, he gets all the sign-ups. That's the only way I can get him here. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you did that, Arlene. You're probably here. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Emily, ah, let me try it again. Our regular evening service on Wednesday is not taking place. In place of that, we have a, spit, a special speaker. Emily McCoy will be here as a special speaker on Wednesday, December 30th at 6.30 p.m. And our, uh, she's going to talk to us about diabetes and uh whether you are or are not, you probably know somebody who is. So it won't hurt for you to get a little education on diabetes. Come out, join us, and uh, well, we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll learn something. Well, we should learn something. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I should learn something. Anyway, uh, our first Friday breakfast for January is going to be canceled. Uh, we have permission slips for all youth and kids activities in the foyer. Uh, if you would please, if you are a youth or a kid or a parent of one, please fill out the appropriate form and return it as soon as possible. If permission slips are not on file, youth will not be able to participate without a parent's without a parent present. Also, if you need tithe envelopes for the next year, please speak to Penny. And cancellations will be listed in the bulletin and on our website at bridenazarene.org. There will also be one call messages sent out with any last minute cancellations. I believe that's the last of our announcements. <sighs> Where are we at? Right? Worship. Oh, I, I miss that offering. That offering, it always, it, it does, it throws everything off. I can't wait till we can pass the plates again. What about you? <laughs> All right, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 148. Would you stand with me this morning as we share our call to worship and then continue to worship in psalm? I said, I mess things up so bad sometimes. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth. You sea monsters in all deeps. Fire, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling His command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for His people. Praise for all His faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to Him. Praise the Lord. Now we can start singing, right? Amen. <laughs> child 
God will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Jesus, or Judah, here is your God. Angels we've heard on 190.
for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And we will be their peace. I saw he got a slinky for Christmas. He brought it. He was telling me about how, how it will walk down the stairs. Yeah. Got to admit, I always liked slinkies. Until they got all tangled up. And then my mom and my dad said, just throw it away. And I'd say, no, I want to fix it. And I'd sit there and I'd try to get it untangled. And I probably never could. <laughs> I don't remember. Must be that traumatic for me. <laughs> Anyway, how, how, how about praises and requests? How about how you've seen God at work in your life this week? How you've been fed? I will say that my week was a little off kilter. I uh, made a trip to Pittsburgh, which I didn't expect. But all in all, that uh, didn't really interfere too much with what I had to do. But uh, Thursday evening, we had... Uh, that was Christmas Eve, right? Thursday evening. <laughs> it's been a blur. Uh, but uh, we had our come and go communion. We had, I think, uh, I counted 58. How many cups were out of the? 61. There were 61. But you figure I took communion every time, so that was probably four or five more times. So about 58 people, I would say, which is pretty good. <coughs> so. Uh, there were people here that I've never had here on a, on a Christmas Eve before. Huh? 
the Cunningham girls who used to go to church here, Emily and Shelby, they were here. And that, that was the first time they've been here that I know of in quite some time. Um, of course, Autumn and her mother come about every year, but this year they brought Shelby, Emily, and Shelby is the one that has a baby, I believe. Her name was Elise, and then Shelby's boyfriend, her husband. I'm not sure what, I, I, I assume it's her husband. I don't know, I've never heard. Anyhow, um, but uh, it was it was uh, somewhat of a busy evening, but then it was good. And uh, I saw a couple people posting stuff on Facebook. That was good. So, how about you? How was your How was your week? How, where have you been fed? How have you seen God at work? This is your chance to share. Yeah, I was with my grand boys, the big ones. Did the Christmas store today? What Christmas Day? Christmas Day. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? I praise God for working in my dad's life. I was able to bring him home last night, so he is home. He's on oh. oxygen. Um, so he still has pneumonia, but it's definitely better than it was, and uh, his oxygen levels are staying pretty good. So I praise God for that. Others? Oh, oh, praise God because he's worthy to be praised. He is. He's still in his throne. He's still saving souls and he's still able to heal this stuff that we have and this coronavirus and all this stuff. He is able to heal us. Amen. Others? I spoke with my co worker, Melody, and uh, her surgery went well. And she's uh, using a walker to walk with, and she um, plans to come back to work in maybe another week. Okay. I remember Melody and her recovery. Anybody else today? Keep continuing. Okay, with. Yeah. <coughs> and she's doing well, um, but. Her next door neighbor is down there, um, which would be my second cousins, are both in their 80s and they both have COVID and I call her Aunt Betty, um, but she fell and broke her hip. Oh. And so she's had surgery and uh, last night talked to my cousin Dave, he said they really haven't been able to talk to her because she's still disoriented from the anesthesia. So just pray for their recovery. Um, they're having a tough time right now. Is it Betty and Dave? Or? Well, Betty and her husband, Jim. Jim. Dave is my cousin that... Is, he doesn't live there. No, he's taking care of them. Okay. He lives in Eastern Maryland. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. So you can remember Betty and Jim Davis in prayer. Anybody else? Remember my cousin still in prayer. Her baby is... They're, they're finding out on the 4th what's going on exactly with with them. But your, your cousin. My cousin. Okay. 
Anybody else? All right. Well, let's go ahead. We're running way ahead of the schedule. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm not talking enough. We don't have Denny here. <laughs> we don't have Denny here to, to, to start us off. But uh, I told him last night I expected him to be at church. I don't know why he's not here. <laughs> But uh, I was surprised whenever I heard, hear him talking on the phone to Jan. Uh, he sounds a whole lot stronger than he, he sounds when you see him in person. Last night, whenever Jan pulled in and I went out to help carry him, or not carry him in, I didn't carry him, <laughs> help lead him in, he sounded really, really weak. And he's got that, uh, his voice is really, really weak. And that, that surprised me. I, I, from here over here, you know, whenever... Jam would talk to him on the phone. I could hear him and hear what he was saying most of the time because he talks so loud. But I don't know if it must have been the phone or what, but it, it just, yet last night whenever he was getting out of the car or whenever she pulled in the driveway, his, his voice was really, really weak. And he is, he, he still needs a lot of prayer. It took a lot of energy just to get him from the hospital room into the car, the ride. And he was pretty exhausted to got there. But, he did. He, he he was hungry when he got home. And I, I stole mashed potatoes from the neighbor's house and some gravy. That's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. But I was threatened. Either get mashed potatoes and gravy, or we're going to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I said I couldn't have that. That's <laughs> bad orders. Now your father and mother. So. <laughs> so anyway, we got him some mashed potatoes and gravy, and he did say. He wants an old-fashioned Christmas dinner, right? And so he's told told Becky that he wants her to fix an old-fashioned Christmas dinner like they used to have. But I'm not sure what all that entails. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and Becky Becky is actually she looks like she's back to almost normal. Yeah, she doesn't have the energy to cook an old-fashioned Christmas dinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. So we'll continue to remember all these, these prayer requests as we go to prayer. We're going to sing away in the manger as we go to prayer today. Let's sing the first two verses, and then after prayer we'll sing the last verse. What do you think?
So, Father, today as we come to you, we come as a, as a people seeking your will, as a people striving to do the things that you call us to do. We come as a people that are hurting. People who are, are, are just seeking for something better. And Father, during this time, this time of year, emotions are running much, much higher. We know that that you are here. But sometimes amidst all the chaos, <coughs> we're so distracted that we fail to look. So today, Father, we ask that you would just enter in, open our eyes, and allow us to see your hand at work in our midst. Allow us to see the great things that you are doing. We, we lift up those who are sick. <coughs> we, we, as we go down our list, we, I, I look at these babies first. Unborn children. Who, whose mothers are having a difficult time. Two of them that were mentioned here this morning. And then I hear of some of the instances that Mommy. of people in the hospital. Father, for these children, though, they have a whole life ahead of them. And we ask that you would just enter into the situation for each and every one. For, Rochelle, for Rochelle's cousin, cousin and, and for, for Bonnie's friend's daughter. We ask, Father, that you would enter into both of those situations. That whatever may be the situation causing difficulties, we ask, Father, that you would clear the way. That these babies would be able to be carried to term, full term. That they would have a natural birth. And that they would be born healthy. That's what we ask. For. That's what we expect. Because we trust in you to hear our prayers and answer. However, Father, we know that our will is not always your will. So we ask that you would just work in the best interest of each and every one of these families. For each and every one of these children. We lift up those who are suffering from this COVID virus. It's devastating. And... You know, we hear all the conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. The conspiracy th theories don't matter. What matters is that we do what we can to prevent catching the, this virus. And if we do catch it, we do what we can to prevent giving it to somebody else. <laughs> I heard Denny's last night saying that he, he wouldn't want anybody to catch us. I think I've heard Brian say the same thing. Father, we ask that in the days to come, that we would see a decline in the number of cases, that this vaccination, while it may be a just a mandate, that, Father, the only true way to rid this world of this virus is through you. Yes. You were the one who can take this virus away. And we ask, Father, today that you would enter into our, our health fields and that you would empower doctors and researchers, nurses and technicians, Father, with it, that you would protect them from this virus, but also, Father, give them the knowledge and the, the certainty to treat not only those who have the virus, but those who are trying to prevent this virus. Father, we ask that you would be with those who do have it. That you would touch their bodies and strengthen them. For those who still have symptoms of the virus from months ago, 
We ask, Father, that you would just continue to restore them back to their, their original self. We ask, Father, that you would give them the energy that it needs to get through the day and do your normal routine. We ask, Father, that you would restore their sense of smell, their sense of taste. And for those who work seriously ill, that you would help their organs return to normal functions. There is so much that goes on with this virus that I've never heard of until just lately. And, and Father, it's a killer. But we trusted you, Father. We trusted you to, to strengthen us. We trusted you to heal us. We trusted you to protect us. And so today we ask that you would enter into the situation of this world, not just here in Bedford County, not here in Pennsylvania, not here in the United States, but the entire world, and that you would take over and take control of this virus. And I'm sure there are many that are using this virus to, to control people, but Father, we ask that you would come in and overcome, overcome the situation. We lift up others this morning, Father. The T Tanya Dick and, and her family, Father, we, we ask that you would touch her body and whatever's going on there, that you would just help make things well again. Restore her to, to good health. Father, we ask that you would just be with her and her family, with her mother and her brothers and sisters, her children, her husband. Father, we ask that you would enter into her situation and that you would just work a miracle in her life. Father, we, we lift up others with cancer. There's so many out there. Many we don't hear about near as much as we used to, but Father, there are so many out there with cancer. And we ask that you would just enter into their lives, enter into their situations, and that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that you would show them a light that would lead them to <coughs> lead them to you, lead them into trusting in you, into following you. Father, open the doors, tear down the walls, open the windows, if need be. We lift up Mrs. Smith today, and. Uh, we ask, Father, you would just continue to touch her body and strengthen her, that, that you would allow her to be able to breathe in the, the oxygen levels she needs, that you would uh, just continue to, to mend her body. And for her, her neighbors, for Betty and Jim Davis, Father, we ask that you would touch their bodies and strengthen them. And, and I'm not sure exactly what... Injuries are, were sustained when Betty fell. But Father, we ask that you would touch her body. Yeah. That if there are broken bones, you would knit them back together. If there's just bumps and bruises, Father, that you would clear them up. But for the COVID virus, Father, we go back to that. Heal their bodies. <coughs> and Father, today we, we lift up Marie, uh, who is not feeling well today, but... <coughs> Father, we ask that you would just help her to feel better. We ask that you would be with her as she prepares to go for her doctor's appointment this week, that, that her kidney numbers would be rising up to where they need to be, to a normal level. And, and while I don't seem to know those levels, you do. You know her body as well as she does. So we ask, Father, that you would just bring her kidney numbers back to where they need to be, Help her to get back on her feet. Help her not to feel so bad today. And, and Father, we ask for our community. Yeah. As we uh, have shared in the blessings of so many people over this Christmas season as a church, we lift up the pastors that we have blessed. That they would be able to minister to their churches. And not only that, but that they would have been truly blessed by you. For the missionaries that we bless. 
We ask, Father, that you would be with Angel as she prepares to go back to her field. And Father, we know that there, with, with the virus, things are being delayed. So we ask, Father, that you would just enter into the situation for her. For the family we bless this year, Father. We don't know all the situation, but we know that they are in need. So we ask, Father, today that while we supplied them with gifts, that they truly find through these gifts a, a greater trust in you, Father. Let them turn to you. That they might come to know you better. That they might come to trust you better. That their faith would, would grow by leaps and bounds, but their joy would grow intensely as well. And Father, today, as we uh, move on to our rest of our service, I ask, Father, today that you would just enter into this service, that the hearts of each and every person would be deeply warm, that our eyes would be fixed upon you, that our ears would be listening intently to not so much the words that I say, but the words that you would want them to hear. Father, today, let your will be done and, and have your way in this service. We ask these things, Father, in your precious name. Amen. <coughs> Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender church take you downstairs for Sunday school. <laughs> All right. Well. Yeah. It's that time of the year again. Isn't it? Time for lists. So why not a bucket list? If you looked at your bulletin, I believe it's in there, the name of the sermon today is a bucket list. <laughs> a few years ago, I watched this movie called about The Bucket List. And, and it's the story of a billionaire, played by Jack Nicholson, I believe it was, named Edward Cole, and, and, and a working class mechanic, played by Morgan Freeman. By who, whose name was Carter Chambers in the movie. And they're thrown together in a hospital room, having nothing at all, having nothing at all alike, except their terminal illness. And while sharing a hospital room, finding out that they both have less than a year to live, they decide that they should make the most of the time they have left. Chambers decides to make a bucket list. And Cole <laughs> decides to join him. The two become close friends, travel the world, doing the things on their bucket list, crossing them off one by one. And these men have their ups and downs as they cross these things off their lists. But after a, disagree uh, after a disagreement and not talking for a while, Cole is asked to speak at Chambers' funeral. Cole decides that he will cross off another item on the list. The end of the movie shows that both of these men, after passing away, have finished their bucket lists. And their cremated remains are placed on top of a, a high, very high, snowy mountain top. Edward finally finds the joy in his life. And Chambers changes a stranger's life forever. Two things that were on their bucket list. So I ask, do you have a bucket list? 
a full bucket list. Because <laughs> I know there are so many things we talk about doing, and yet we never get to them. You have a bucket list. You know, a list of things you want to do before you kick the bucket. That's why it's called a bucket list. You know that, right? It's a slightly crude way of looking at our inevitable demise, but it does call us to focus on living and not dying. In our passage today, we see a man who has a bucket list in a way. His name is Simeon, and he hangs out in the temple. Every day, he... He stays there waiting, waiting for a promise to come to pass. So would you turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. And stand with me as we share in the reading of our text for today, for this morning. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up, Jesus. They brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. For as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be de designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came to the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband 78 years after her marriage. Then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your words, for these stories that tell of Jesus' life, for, for, the, for the words that teach us how to live our lives. Father, today we ask that you are... Your word would be revealed to us, and that your blessing would be upon us. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So Simeon had a bucket list, a very unusual bucket list. And we're told that the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would see the Lord's Messiah before he died. So it was just that one thing on Simeon's bucket list. No trip to Hawaii. No climb up Kilimanjaro, no French dinner in Paris at midnight or afternoon with Merle Street or whoever the actress was in the movie. Just one thing, seeing the Lord's Messiah. That's a pretty big one. That's a pretty big one thing, don't you think? As it turns out, it was even bigger than Simeon thought. We're told that, that Simeon was looking forward to the consolation of Israel the Messiah, to be revealed to them so that they would be restored. In other words, he was looking forward to the salvation of God's people, to Israel. But look at what happens. The Holy Spirit is revealed. Reveals, and the Holy Spirit reveals to Simeon, and we're not told how, 
that, that he would see the Lord's Messiah before he died. Every day, Simeon would look for a child born the Messiah. Every day, as parents brought their children into the temple for the rites of purification, Simeon would look to see if maybe this one was the Christ. Now, for some parents, that might creep them out a little bit. They're going to the temple, and there's this old man. He keeps checking out every baby that walks in. Nowadays, they would probably have him carried away in, in, in handcuffs because they would worry that he was some sort of a, well, a demented person. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, but that's what Simeon did. He, he, he sat at the temple every day waiting and watching. When Mary and Joseph appear in the temple with Jesus, Simeon knew. He knew without a shadow of a doubt. How? I don't know. But he just knew this was the one. This was the one. He took the child in his arms. And that's when something happened that no one anticipated. Not even Simeon. Simeon gazed into the baby Jesus' eyes. Have you ever looked into a baby's eyes? You look and you wonder, what are they thinking? But Simeon gazed into the baby Jesus' eyes and declared that this child was not only Israel's salvation, but the salvation of the Gentiles as well. Now, to be a Jew and saying these things, that's pretty magnificent, if you ask me. We don't catch the magnitude of this statement because we've been brought up Christian. Most of us are Gentiles. And we believe that Jesus Christ came for the salvation of all people. You know, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. John 3, 16 and 17. We live by that verse. Matter of fact, some people think that's really the only verse in the Bible that matters. But the truth be told, at this day and age, or in this time, when Simeon was living, Israel thought, the people of Israel thought that Jesus, the Messiah, was only going to be born for the Jews. <coughs> to say the Messiah, the Christ, had come for the salvation of Israel is one thing. And it was probably correct in that day and age. But to say the Messiah, the Christ, had come for all people, those dirty Gentiles, well, that was something else. That was something radically new. And I don't know of anywhere in the scriptures before that 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 was, even ever, that was ever suggested. So there are a couple things we need to remember here. First of all, Luke, the gospel writer, is a Gentile. Luke is a Gentile. He's a doctor. But he's a Gentile. And he was writing a gospel for Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Do you remember how Luke's gospel begins? Luke states that he's writing to the most excellent Theophilus. You might not know the... He, he says, you might know the certainty concerning the things in which you were instructed. Verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. Luke wrote his gospel to the Gentile audience through a high-ranking official named Theophilus. Actually, I, I think I read somewhere that Theophilus might not be a real person to begin with. It might be just a figurehead so that it could be sent to different groups and not and it, nobody could be persecuted for having that letter. Incidentally, we don't know who Theophilus was, as I said. But we do know that his name means friend of God. Friend of God wonder, are we friends of God? We sing that song sometimes, I am a friend of God. Anyway, so to hear that the salvation Jesus brings is for all people is really quite striking. It really is good news. Nevertheless, it appears Luke goes out of his way to show Jesus' Jewishness in this passage. Five times in our text, we're told that Jesus' family observed the law. Jesus' life begins with fulfilling the law and 
coming to the temple. The whole family comes to the temple for their purification, which is a ritual. Mary, as a new mother, was to undergo a rite of purification 40 days after she had given birth. The usual sacrifice offered after the rite of purification was a one-year lamb, a one-year-old lamb, along with a pigeon or turtle dove as a sin offering. Sounds complicated. But if the family could not afford a lamb, two turtle doves or two pigeons could be offered. The fact that our text mentions a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons tells us that Jesus' family was too poor to bring a lamb. Unless, of course, we read this symbolically. And I'll be honest, as I was reading this week, this is the first time I ever heard this. If we read this symbolically and we see the lamb to be offered as Jesus himself. That was an interesting concept. So we have to ask, why the emphasis on his Jewishness? Why the emphasis on Jesus' Jewishness from Luke, the Gentile? If he's writing to Gentiles, why would the Gentiles care if he was Jewish? As long as he was offering salvation for all people. Well, I think it has to do with the need to connect Jesus with the God of Israel. Jesus was not just a son of a God. Not like, who were the ones that were sons of gods in Greek mythology? You know, Hercules. He was half son of a God. But Jesus is much more than that. He was the son of the God. The one and only God. And not just any God, but the God. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. The God of creation. The God of the Exodus. The God of the wilderness. The one and only true God. Not one of those fake Greek or Roman gods that I mentioned earlier. It's through Jesus' Jewishness that Luke places his gospel in a larger context. A bigger story. Through Jesus' Jewishness, the story of the Messiah becomes the story of the law fulfilled. The promise kept. And the living out of God's promised salvation for all people. Every one of us. In the movie, The Bucket List, we find two cancer patients who became the most unlikely of friends, and they end up spending three months together, each fulfilling a bucket list of things they'd always wanted to do before dying. What they discover is that their bucket lists really have more to do with living fully and faithfully than giving up and waiting for their demise. They end up discovering that what gives them the greatest joy are not the selfish, self-centered items on their bucket lists, but the things they took for granted, like a meal with family or the love shared between friends. For one of these men, they have, they have to learn the hard way. It takes the death of his friend to re-engage with his estranged daughter. It takes the loss of a close friend to realize a valuable lesson. To sense the saving grace that flows from forgiveness. There's nothing earth shattering in the movie. Nothing terribly profound. Although I will say whenever I watched it I felt this bubbling in my heart. Sometimes it's the simplest things that make the most impact on us. It's not the gift we receive, but it's the gift we give. But this movie calls into question the value of having a bucket list and the content of what that bucket list should contain. What's on your bucket list? What things have you avoided in living your life, wasting valuable time. <coughs> I hope I said that in a way that you understand it, because it was a hard sentence to write. What things have you avoided in your life, 
why you are wasting valuable time. Maybe that sounds a little more accurate to what I wanted to say. What things have you avoided because you're afraid of what may happen? I've wasted a lot of time afraid of what might happen. Janice will tell you, she has to push me many times. <laughs> what things have you avoided? Wasting time because you are too stubborn to ask or offer forgiveness. What things have you avoided? Wasting time because you are too proud to admit when you may be wrong. What things could you be doing by trusting in the leading of the Holy Spirit? By listening to that still small voice. <clears throat> you know that voice. The inner dialogue you hear when you face issues. What things could you be doing by stepping out on faith and doing what you think you may be called to do? Our larger context is the Christian faith. Do you believe that we are saved by grace through the faith in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that God's gift of eternal life begins right here and right now when we give our life to Him? Do you truly know the grace of forgiveness? Do you truly know the joy of faith? Maybe a Christian bucket list is something we ought to consider, don't you think? Not because you're afraid to die, but because in Christ you're longing to live. Maybe we can learn something from old Simeon. Maybe the first thing on our bucket list should be a sincere hope to see Christ as well. I've said this several times that I don't know who I've said it to or, or when I said it, but I know. The one thing I look forward to when I get to when I get to heaven. I don't want to sound too confident. I don't I don't want to sound arrogant, but the one thing I look forward to is seeing Jesus face to face. And thank you. So many times we live at such a fast pace that we fail to take the time and appreciate the little things that Jesus has done for us. And I think if we had that sincere hope to see Christ, if that were on our bucket list, it wouldn't take long to discover the fact that we can and do see the Messiah, the Christ, every day, each and every day, when we look for Him. We see God's saving Son in acts of care and compassion, either done by you or somebody else. Maybe they're done for you. We see God's saving Son and the love that we share as, as a family of God. We see God's saving Son. We see Jesus in the forgiveness that we experience, whether we are giving it to somebody else or receiving it for something we've done. And beyond that, our individual bucket list could contain a whole host of different things. But they would all find themselves flowing from this larger context of life, of this life of faith, grounded in Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with wanting to go to Hawaii or climb Kilimanjaro or to have that French dinner in Paris at midnight. But it's more a matter of discovering the joys of faithful living. Discovering the joys that come to us through everyday life. Through the things we take for granted. And the people we see regularly, almost every day. God is at work in our everyday, touching lives, touching our lives, calling us to greater heights of love, discipleship, and service.
I ask how we've been fed every week. I try to anyway. Sometimes I forget to ask that specific question. But how have we been fed? How have we engaged in the fellowship with other believers or with people who are not believers? How do we engage in evangelism, sharing the story of Jesus Christ to other people? Sometimes we may have to use words, but most of the time it's how we act. It's the kindness we show to other people. It's the love we share for those who are in need. And discipleship. How do we engage in discipleship? How do we learn from other people in the church? How do we teach those who come behind us to live their lives in a way that would be pleasing to God. Many times the greatest thing we can do is live our lives faithfully so others can see it. For us as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's always been about living. Living faithfully and fully. And not worrying about dying. Christ has done the dying for us. As disciples of Jesus Christ, it's not even about a full bucket, but a bucket perpetually being poured out in love for God and for love of our neighbor. Pouring the love as much as we can on those around us. Sharing with them the blessings that we've received and giving to them a faith that knows no bounds. Today I want to challenge you. Don't be afraid of dying. Dying is easy. We just stop breathing. Living is the hard part. I've heard that somewhere in a movie or something. But it really made an impact. Don't be afraid of dying. Because living is the hard part. Living and sharing our faith with others. That's your challenge. That's what we are called to do. Living our lives so that others will see Christ through us. Seems like we should sing a song. I'm thinking living by faith, but I don't know the page number, and I'm sure they don't have it up there, so I'm going to ask you to pull out a hymnal, and as soon as I find the page number... <laughs> Do you have it up there? Living, living, living by faith. <laughs> if anybody else finds it before me, please shout out the number because I'm having a terrible time finding it. 566? On, uh, as I was preparing this, I, I was trying to think of a song I told Ronnie, let's sing Oh Come All You Faithful. But... Uh, I don't know. You got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, right? right. 566. We'll sing the first verse and the last verse. How's that? Have you all found the hymnal? <laughs>
for this day. And I'm grateful, Father, for the blessings that you've given to me. I'm thankful for the blessings you've given to us as a church. But I thank you most of all for sending your son Jesus to this world. That we don't have to be confined to the sacrificial system. That we can call on your name and be forgiven of our transgressions. Yes. Father, we ask today for those who are among us who may be seeking your will in their lives, who are seeking the salvation that you have promised. We ask, Father, today that you would help them and guide them to a place where they're able to, to receive that forgiveness, to, to receive that mercy. And Father, today, as we leave this place, we ask that your blessing would be upon each and every one of us. That we would be able to go out into our communities to serve you, to love you, to share that same love with our, with our friends, our neighbors, even the people we do not know that we encounter throughout our lives. Father, help us to pour your love upon them. Help us to be an example. Help us to live our lives as your evangelistic message to the world. We thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. And I hope you have a good New Year's if I don't see you before, but on Wednesday evening, 6.30, we will be here listening to Emily talk to us about diabetes. All right. You have a good week.